This is more of a message for Georgia fans, even if he comes out there and is, is just good through the first one or two games. Just be patient. Hello, welcome to Always College Football. Today is Monday, August 22nd. We hope you're enjoying the show wherever you're getting the show, whether that's on ESPN's YouTube channel or if you're here with us via the podcast network. We really appreciate it. Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Please like, rate, and subscribe. It helps us out. It helps the show out. And we look forward to the future interaction that we'll have with you. We have a great game plan in store for you today as we are going to have former Georgia Bulldog Aaron Murray join us today to help us break down the number three team in the land. Last Friday, we broke down Alabama. We're going to do some of the top teams, do a deep position-by-position dive into what they have, what flaws they may have, how they may be vulnerable, how they may be strong, et cetera. So we did Bama on Friday. I did that one. Then we have Aaron Murray to join us for the Georgia breakdown today. And then in the days and weeks to come, we'll do Ohio State, we'll do Clemson, we'll do a few others. So we look forward to those interactions that we'll have down the road. We're also going to get into the quarterback competitions that are boiling up various places throughout the country. Some, several, I guess, teams have announced their starting quarterback this past weekend on the heels of the second scrimmage, but there's still a couple of quarterback competitions that are very much up for debate. We'll listen to some coaches and what they have to say on each of those. So without much further ado, it's the Georgia Breakdown. Let's talk about it. All right, former Georgia quarterback, one of the all-time greats in the SEC, joins us now. He's Aaron Murray, and he is now joining ESPN. So it's great to have you on the ESPN team, first and foremost, Aaron. But I also want to ask you about your alma mater. So let's take off your unbiased ESPN hat and put on a red and black Georgia Bulldog hat for the next 15 or 20 minutes. Does that work for you? Hey, man, that's that's easy work. It's always been hard. Uh, the first five years of my life in this whole TV world, they really haven't given me a lot of opportunities to cover Georgia games because like the helmet behind me, uh, they're afraid I'll say go dogs on air. So <laughs> I, it will be easy for me to uh, show some love to my alma mater. Well, good. We're, we're looking for partisan breakdowns here. Uh, I did Alabama's on Friday. We're doing Georgia's now and and we'll be getting into clemson's and ohio states and others here down the road so let's get partisan for a minute let's start with stetson bennett uh talk to georgia folks i think for the most part people are sold on him and yet i do the spring game and the second carson beck does anything significant i get tweets he's our quarter he's my quarterback one like i know stetson's the guy but i hope carson gets his chance like where are we at right now with the quarterback situation at Georgia? And is Stetson finally getting the love he deserves? He's getting more. I don't know if he's getting what he deserves. I mean, the, the, as we know, the first national championship quarterback since the uh, you know Buck Ballou back there in '80. So it's been a long time, and there's been a lot of great quarterbacks. I mean, just since I you know started watching Georgia, you think of Greeny and Shock and you know Stafford, and 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 I had a good little run, and then you get. Uh, guys, you know, five star guys like Justin Fields and, and Eason and, you know, Jake Fromm, like, man, all these top guys that the fans get invested in from high school, you know, from their sophomore, junior year. They're watching them. They're seeing, OK, hey, we made their top five. We made their top three. We have a chance to get this five star kid out of wherever. And like I said, they've been watching him for two, three years. And then they commit. Everyone's excited. Hey, this is the guy that's going to win us a national championship. Stetson wasn't that, as we all know. Stetson was a walk-on. No one really cared that Stetson went up, went to Athens and went to the University of Georgia. So there wasn't that that time invested in him of learning who he is, of of you know feeling that he was going to be the one, like I said, to lead us to the promised land. So, uh, yeah, there is a a still a, a large portion of Georgia fan base that wants a guy like Carson Beck or Brock Vandergriff to get in there and be the guy because they believe stars matter more than anything. They believe if you're a four or five star guy that you are automatically the best person on that roster. And you know, as you and I probably know this, uh, stars really don't mean anything once you get into the locker room. And, and especially the quarterback position, there's just so many things that go into being a quarterback other than just throwing the football. And yes, you have to throw the football in order to be successful, especially in the SEC. But there's you have to be a great leader. You got to be a guy that outworks everyone. Uh, you got to have guts. You got to have poise and sets in someone that has all of that and, and why he was able to have success last year. And, I, and, and a big reason why I think he's going to have a lot of success this year. Let's talk about his weapons on the perimeter. Um, I think it's a very underrated group. Now, 
I, I think their offense, for the most part, is not necessarily always going to put up 50 a game. But if it got into a scenario where it became a little bit of a shootout, I think they'd be more capable of hanging in a game like that in 2022 than they would be maybe even in 2021. So you look at A.D. Mitchell, you look at uh, Lad McConkey, Kiaris Jackson's done some good things over the course of his career. And of course, the wide receiver, the, the, the tight end room is off the charts good with Brock Bowers, Darnell Washington, maybe Eric Gilbert gets a chance to be a guy this year, which certainly seems like things are trending in that direction. So how would you assess the weapons on the perimeter relative to what we've seen from that group in years past? Well, I think this is the best group I've seen Georgia have in the past few years. I mean, my biggest issue with Georgia offense when everyone wants to, you know, focus on the quarterback and fo- focus so much on Stetson has been, we've been very average. You know, what did LSU have a couple of years ago? What has Alabama had? These teams that are winning national championships, uh, elite receiving play, guys that could take a bubble, guys that could take a slant, you know, make a couple of guys miss. And all of a sudden it's a 67 yard touchdown. It's not that easy to methodically move the ball down the field and feel like you're going to be able to score 30, 40 points. In today's game, in order to win, you need explosive plays. You need yak, and and Georgia has really lacked that big time star player. And obviously, everyone's like, "Oh, look at George Pickens, and look what he's doing there in the NFL with the Pittsburgh Steelers." And George was a great talent. That's not. That's, I will. I will, you know, say that. But he didn't show that at all times at Georgia. Obviously, there was the off the field issues. There was the injury that he missed most of last season. Just wasn't very consistent when he done the red and black. So they haven't had that guy in the outside burn last year with someone who's supposed to be pretty good. Uh, he was banged up for the majority of the year. And obviously now that he's moved on to Alabama, it's kind of finding who that next player is. I really like Lad McConkey. I think he's a utility receiver. You can put him in the slot. He can play outside, has elite speed. A.D. Mitchell, we saw him really come into his own towards the end of the season last year, made some big plays in the playoffs. He looks the part. If you go to the practice and you look at A.D. Mitchell, you're like, man, that guy looks like an elite receiver. So I'm really excited about him. Uh, Kiaris Jackson's been great when healthy. And then the tight end room is, is probably the best tight end room that I've seen in a long, long time. Brock Bowers, elite guy, matchup nightmare. Gilbert, you alluded to, you get him mentally right and, and talking to people inside that, that, that building. He is focused he is determined he's super excited about this offense and this new new opportunity to go out there and show himself and then darnell washington six seven six eight big time matchup nightmare as well so you're going to see a lot of shifting of personnel groups of georgia this year you're going to see some 12 personnel some 13 personnel shoot you may even see some 14 personnel because they got three or four or five tight ends that are extremely talented and matchup nightmares for a secondary so i said to me this is the best group of receivers slash tight ends I've seen Georgia have in some time. And the thing on top of that that gives me a lot of confidence for Stetson is Stetson has had the time to develop the chemistry with this core of guy, core of, of receivers. You know, the past two years, Stetson really hasn't had the opportunity to work with the ones. He's been working with the threes and fours and primarily the freshmen for the majority of his reps in, in spring, summer, and fall camp. So he has had the time to build the timing, to build the communication, to build that chemistry. I think this is offense, like you said, it's, it's not going to score 50 points a game, but I'm looking for them to be a top five offense in the SEC. Yeah, it can definitely make that stride this year, it feels like, especially with all the pieces they bring back. I do think the biggest and most significant loss is James Cook on the entire offense. You can look at a couple of the pieces up front, that's fine. Uh, you look at, at a, you know, uh, Jermaine Burton or, or like what you alluded to, what Pickens is doing. Pickens was not, not really himself at any point last year until the very end. So uh, I think receivers and all those guys, they're they're replaceable. However, I do feel like James Cook, with his versatility out of the backfield, is not going to be just, hey, plug and play. We can have anybody mm-hmm. do that. We can, they can take it at the line of scrimmage and turn it into something. And plus the matchups he can create and empty and stuff like that. He'll go out and play wide receiver and beat you right over the top, drop it in the bucket for him. So James Cook and Zamir White being gone means more opportunities for Kenny McIntosh and Kendall Milton. But can those two, Kendall Milton and McIntosh, that is, can they adequately replace the guys that were in front of them last year? I think running the football, yes. Uh, obviously, you, what, what James did was a matchup nightmare. I mean, over and over again, what you see him do? They matched him one-on-one on the outside. And anytime Stetson saw a linebacker run out with James Cook, it was automatic, like, hey, we're going to James. You know, one-on-one, whether it's a hitch or a go ball, it's, in, in, as we know, it's a matchup game. You know, as a quarterback, where can I find my matchup? This isn't a static game anymore where you just line up and, you know, your eye formation, um, you know, base offense, not a lot of motions, not a lot of shifts, and, and you're facing a base defense. 
It's all about, hey, how can I move my chess pieces around? How can I move a guy like James Cook and get him matched up in space against a linebacker or safety? How can I move a guy like Brock Bowers and get him matched up against a linebacker or safety in space? Allow my quarterback to decipher, is it man, is it zone? Give him those pre-snap indicators. That way it's, his job is a lot easier going against these defenses that are a lot more exotic. You know, when you and I played, it was, you know, cover two, cover three, man, quarters. You kind of knew what you're going to get, mostly four down fronts. You're, you're, you know, basic blitz from a Sam or Will, and maybe you see a corner cat. Nowadays, you're seeing a lot more on the defensive side of the football. The quarterback needs as much pre-snap indicators as he can. So anytime you can move, once again, a James Cook or a Brock Bowers out in the formation, you kind of get those indication, man zone, where's the pressure going to come from? How can I get to that matchup early and go out there and execute at a high level? So, you know, they're not going to have what they had with James Cook. I'll tell you that. And that's why I think you're going to see more and more of a focus on getting those tight ends on the field, getting to, once again, that 12 personnel, that 13 personnel and saying, hey, defensively, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay in base defense? Do you want to come out there with your, your traditional four defense alignment, three linebackers and four DBs? Okay, then we'll we'll split our guys out. You know, we'll find a way to get uh, you know Bowers and and Gilbert or, or Washington matched up against a linebacker safety. If you want to play small, if you want to bring in a nickel and take out your Sam or Will, then we'll bring those guys in and run the football. So I think it's going to be a lot of Georgia trying to play chess, trying to figure out what they want to do, you know, personnel wise, how the defense is going to match that personnel. And then, then from there, move those pieces around, try to get them matched up against, you know, lesser guys on the defensive side of the football, guys that aren't as comfortable covering in space. And then offensive line, finally, on that side of the ball. Anything to be concerned of up there? I think Broderick Jones will be just fine. He's played extensively. Mm-hmm. I think that Van Prawn being back in the in the middle will be just fine. McClendon. I mean, I look at the offensive line. I'm not I have not lost one ounce of sleep over that group with what they bring back. Are we in good shape there? No, you're in great shape. You lose to your solid up front at the center position. The two tackles, I think, are going to be really, really talented this year. Um, so I think those are the spots. If you want to be very good offensively, can you show up the outsides and can you be very, very good right up the middle? I think they're fine. You may see some rotation at the guard spot with three or four guys as they get that spot figured out here in the next couple of weeks heading into that first game versus Oregon. But overall, I'm, I'm very bullish about this offensive line. I think it's talented from from left to right. Um, a lot of great leadership. So, yeah, I think offensively, once again, as a whole right now, you know, a lot of check marks. Quarterback returning, a lot of confidence in him. You know, I think a very good running backs that are ready to prove themselves. Uh, tight ends, some of the best tight ends in the country, if not the best tight ends in the country. And and to me, uh, I think the most improved unit of all, the receiving spot this year is going to take a huge step forward than what we've seen the past couple of years. So, Offensively, I'm excited and, and, and they should be. You know, it's, it's been a lot of work for Todd Munkin to get this offense where he wants it to be. And for them, they know they have to step up and play at a higher level than what we saw last year. The defense is not going to be the same. Defense will be good, but it's not going to be giving up, you know, three, seven, 10 points a game. It's 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 going to be offense's turn to kind of step it up a little bit and win some football games. That's where I was ready to get to because I, I'm not worried about their offense at all. I think they'll be fine on that side of the ball. It didn't worry me whatsoever. Uh, I want to talk about the pieces that we don't know about on this side. Like we know Jalen Carter there in the middle of the defensive defensive tackle nose guard wherever you want to put him. He's going to be just fine. He's going to be an absolute beast. Uh, we know at the end of the line of scrimmage, Nolan Smith has a chance to be uh, you know all American type of player. We know Keely Ringo there at corner has a chance to be an All-American type of player. We think Chris Smith, him being back, is significant. He, of course, had some really bright spots last year, most notably the first game of the year, pick six against Clemson there at safety. So I feel pretty good about those spots. But what I'm very concerned about is off the ball inside linebacker because you lose not Mm -hmm. one, not two, but three of your best off the ball inside linebackers, knowing that you had three guys get drafted in the first 90 picks. So... Who's stepping up there knowing that that's such an important piece and the best Georgia defenses always have that guy in the middle. doesn't matter if it's N'Kobe Dean or Roquan Smith, that guy in the middle, that's an eraser. Who is that eraser this year? Yeah. And and I think first off, when you go through the pieces, they do have return. I think we focus so much on what they lost last year, but you know, Jalen Carter to me is top three, four player in all of America. You know, when I turned on the tape last year and watched Georgia's defense, you know, the first thing through the first two weeks is like, who is 88? Like, yeah, there's there, there's big, you know, Jordan Davis, there's Nicobe, there's this guy, there's that guy, but like 88 just kept flashing to me. And I think you got a guy like that to really be the the 
the core guy that set the tempo for the defense. I think you, 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 you know, everything should follow suit after that. But, you know, some guys like, you know, that I've seen, I've talked to, um, guys like Jamon Dumas Johnson, uh, right there in the middle linebackers had a really good spring fall, uh, fall camp heading into the season. They're really excited about what he could do, filling some shoes from, for, for Nicobe Dean. Uh, Traysman Marshall, you know, another guy in that inside linebacker position. So those two are going to be the keys in that inside spot. I think that once again, Nolan Smith on the outside is going to shore some things up. Jalen Carter on the inside is going to be great, but you need that communicator. You need the guys that could set the tempo, that make the calls, that make the adjustments. So, you know, it's going to be a tall task for those guys to fit the shoes of, of a Nicobe, but, you know, all indications are that they're having great camps. They look very good heading into the season. And overall, as a defense, you know, the one thing I keep hearing is speed, 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 speed. They're fast. They, they fly the football. They're making plays. But then when they make mistakes, the issue is they're making the mistakes pretty fast as well. So all of a sudden, their guys are kind of out of position, trying to do too much. And then, then you see gaping holes on that side of the football. So they're going to make mistakes. They're young. They're inexperienced. But they're very talented. They, they have tremendous athleticism. Uh, they're going to make a lot of plays in this defense. So I, I don't think the defense necessarily takes – too big of a step back this year. Obviously, it is a step back. It's hard to replicate what they did on that side of the football last year. But I think there's enough good pieces at every single level. Jalen, Nolan and the front seven, uh, guys like Keely and Chris Smith on the back end, William Poole there at the nickel, plenty of pieces that returned from last year. It's the rest of the guys catching up and and and, and getting up to speed. And, you know, the good thing for them as a team in, in general this year, I don't think the schedule is very hard. I think it's a very manageable schedule. I think the offense is going to be relied along or relied upon uh, a little bit more heavily than it was last year as those young guys get going on that side of the football and defense. What game specifically concerns you most for Georgia this year? Uh, I'm, I'm really not too concerned. Maybe Tennessee later in the season. You know, the one good thing is you get them at home. Uh, it's later on. You've had time to, to get the defense rated to, 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 I guess, figure out an offense that is as, you know, has the potential to be really darn good, uh, with Hendon Hooker back and some of the receivers they have on the outside. Uh, so I think they will hopefully have matured by the time the volunteers come there to Athens. But that's the only thing that concerns me. I mean, look at last year. You know, the thing that the only offense that really concerned me was Alabama. You know, they really didn't face a an offense that was going to score 40 50 points per game that you knew could match up against their defense until they faced Alabama in the SEC championship game uh really showed some some weaknesses on the back end and you know I'm still kind of torn you know obviously I'm really was was really excited they won the national championship but if Alabama didn't have the injuries at the receiving position I think we could have maybe seen a little bit different game there in Indianapolis so when you look at their schedule I think offensively they're going to be you know an offense that could score 30 40 points each and every weekend uh defensively I really don't see them challenged too much until they face really a team like in an offense like Tennessee I'm, I, I guess on a scale of one to ten, how confident are you that they can repeat? I would say probably about an eight. You know, the, they're going to get to Atlanta, so that's that's step one. I mean, can you get to Atlanta? There's an opportunity for them to be eleven and one. Obviously, a really logistic opportunity, legitimate, excuse me, opportunity to be twelve and zero. Uh, the East will be better. There's no doubt about it. You know, Kentucky with Will Levis. I know you're not the biggest fan of Will Levis, but he's he's a talented quarterback. I'll, I'll give him that. He is a talented kid. Uh, Hennon Hooker in Tennessee, I think, will be a good football team. Florida is a question mark. We'll see what they look like. Uh, I think Auburn is still in a spot right now where they'll be good, but nothing that really scares me if I'm the Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, so overall right now, they should – win the East. They should be playing in Atlanta, most likely versus Alabama. Uh, I just think Alabama is the, the cream of the crop this year. You look at Alabama defensively, they're loaded. Obviously, Bryce returning on offense. I'm interested to see what the receivers look like, but uh, Alabama is the standard. If Alabama stays healthy, most likely they win in Atlanta. Can Georgia do what they did last year once again? And will the committee look look favorable upon Georgia? If Georgia's 12-0, and then loses to Alabama and Atlanta, do they once again get the nod and move on to the college football playoff? We'll see. But I think all that matters right now is getting to the SC championship game. I think that is, if they stay healthy, a 75, 80%, even 90% chance they make it there. Uh, and then can you make that a competitive game versus Alabama and then put it in the committee's hands to see if you can sneak back into the college football playoff?
All right, love it, man. Great stuff. Really, really appreciate it. Is there anything else we need to know about Georgia? Just leaving it open ended to you. I feel like we've hit it from every possible angle. Is there anything we don't know about as fans of college football that we need to know about the Georgia Bulldogs? Uh, I think right now it's just if, this is more of a message for Georgia fans for Stetson. Like even if he comes out there and is is just good through the first one or two games, just be patient, enjoy yourself. Give the man some slack, for goodness sakes. He is a tremendous leader, uh, both on and off the field. I'm super excited about his season. It would not surprise me if Setson's a guy at the end of the season we look back and has thrown anywhere from 30 to 35 touchdowns, five interceptions, and maybe you know five rushing touchdowns as well. No, I love it, man. Well, we're so excited for this season. We appreciate the time. We look forward to the podcast that you're launching with T. Bob A. Bear. Uh, and you got to tell me what that is exactly. Just so, just so we know that if anybody's listening to this, want to hear what you guys have to say, I know that you're going to do a great job with that. So, where exactly can we get that? What What do we need to keep an eye out for when it comes to what you guys are launching? Yeah, so we're we're launching actually today. We're going to be filming our first episode here shortly uh, with the volume and 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 Colin Coward. We're, we're super excited about it. Just like you will be covering college sports and and, and primarily college football uh, throughout the year, five days a week. And uh, as you know, too, T-Bob is is a character. So I just I have the job of making sure we don't talk too much about Star Wars and uh, <laughs> Harry Potter and wherever the hell T-Bob wants to get to. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're super excited and, you know, super excited as well to kind of see this whole podcast and, and sports world continue to develop with shows like yourself and and, and what we're doing with, with the volume. Oh, rising tide lifts all ships, man. And more college football coverage, the better in my eyes. Aaron Murray joining us here on Always College Football. All right, great visit there with Aaron as we take a look at one of the top three teams in America, the reigning and defending national champions, the Georgia Bulldogs. So a great breakdown there. Look, we know there's no issues when it comes to the quarterback spot. We just talked about it. We know Stetson Bennett's the guy for the Georgia Bulldogs. However, their week one opponent's quarterback situation is at least at this point very much up in the air, which is probably a little different than what we all thought going into fall camp. Here's Dan Lanning, the head coach of the Oregon Ducks, on his quarterback situation. Uh, we had four picks today. Uh, four picks today. We had so, several balls on the ground. Um, you know, in general, just ball in jeopardy situations that we got to do a better job of. Is that just the defense being opportunistic and making plays or sloppy on the offense? It's a combination of both. You know, it's a combination of both. Not catching it clean turns into a tip ball, turns into an interception, some poor decision making, um, some you know, taking advantage of an opportune moment and, and doing a good job attacking the ball. So I think it's a combination. We got to do a better job taking care of it, for sure. When those, are, when those are all factors that obviously go into making a decision on quarterback and who the starter is going to be, how does this impact the timeline? Are you, do you feel like you're a couple of days away from making that decision, or does this change that decision? I don't think I'm telling you guys. Well, McElroy, like an honest approach from Dan Lanning there, uh, I'm not going to tell you guys. What do you take on his uh, interaction with the media and just saying, I'm not going to tell you guys who the quarterback is? It's not that dissimilar to what we've heard from other guys that are kind of from that Nick Saban tree. I mean, they they want to keep things close to the vest. He doesn't feel, especially probably as a defensive guy, he probably doesn't feel like there's any benefit to making the starting quarterback known. If you're an offensive guy or an offensive-minded head coach, maybe you played quarterback at some point or another, you understand the positives that come with announcing who your starting quarterback's going to be, especially if there's a wide gap between the number one and the number two. But as a defensive guy, which Dan Lanning, of course, is, I have a feeling he kind of looks at it and says, man, I, I know that if I'm a defensive coordinator and I know what the skill set is of the starting quarterback that we're playing against, I can better put together a defensive plan that could neutralize what advantages that quarterback may have. So <laughs> that's the difference between being a defensive minded head coach and an offensive minded head coach. The offensive minded head coach, hey, we want our quarterback to be the voice of our offense. We want to have a united front centering around that quarterback. Whereas the defensive guy is like, no, I'm not telling you anything because if I know his skill set, I can take away what he does well. So when you look at the quarterback spot at Oregon, I, I think it's going to be Bo Nix. Maybe I'm crazy, but I get the sense a guy that started 35 games and has seen as much as he has going against a defense like or like Oregon's going to face in week one in Georgia, even though they're replacing a lot of pieces. I happen to think the veteran presence that is Bo Nix, having been in the fire before, got to think he's going to have a fairly significant advantage. Now, it could be any of the three, but 
I'd be surprised if it's not Bo Nix. Another new head coach in a, well, I guess a very familiar head coach in a new place is Brian Kelly. He, of course, comes down from Notre Dame. He's at LSU and is in the midst of a serious quarterback competition. At one point, there were three guys competing for the starting job. Now that number is down to two in case you've been under a rock for the last week and a half. Miles Brennan, the former starting quarterback for the LSU Tigers in 2020, has decided to shut down his football career at the moment. Will it be revisited down the road? I don't know, but it won't be revisited at LSU. So it's down to two guys, Jaden Daniels, formerly of Arizona State, and Garrett Nussmeyer, who started some games last year uh, at LSU. So here's Brian Kelly on the quarterback position. It's pretty clear that it's it's um, Nussmeyer and it's Daniels and 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 they just have more experience, you know, than than Walker Howard. Walker's done a great job, um, but I think you know his situation now would be an emergency situation. And you know, can we redshirt him? Right, um, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, so it's a two-man race. Look, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they both get the opportunity to play at some time this year. But we're going to have to name a starter, and that's going to happen here pretty quickly. Ah, Brian Kelly playing the old double quarterback system, Greg. He's done that in the past at Notre Dame and at Cincinnati. Are LSU fans ready for that? Uh, you know, and, and are they ready for it in game one if necessary? So let's make sure that we uh, that everybody understands Brian Kelly is not one that's going to lean on using a two quarterback system. He will, without question, if a guy's struggling, he will quickly pull them out of the game, insert the next guy, and see if that guy can maybe jumpstart their engine offensively. He's not to the same extent as like a Steve Spurrier. Like, hey, well, you know, Shane Matthews, Jesse Palmer, Danny Wolf are like, we'll see who starts. I don't know. If I, Danny, it's you. Go ahead. You had a good warm up. Like, no, it's not going to be that. All right. So it's, it's one of those scenarios with Brian Kelly that if a guy's struggling a little bit, he feels like he can maybe get a better view of what's going on. Maybe the game will slow down for him if he goes to the bench. So let's just look back at his track record. All right. And then there have been injuries and things like that in the past. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a scenario where they've always replaced a guy. Like for instance, I remember back in, I believe it was 2015 Malik Zaire was the starting quarterback. And then all of a sudden he gets hurt week two. They throw into Sean Kaiser and Deshaun Kaiser's the guy 2016's total disaster. Guys are up and down with Kaiser and Brandon Wimbush and Malik Zaire uh, Ian Book was a true freshman on that team. So that 16 team was a little bit thrown off. Then you look at a scenario in 2017 where Wimbush did a lot of pretty good things. 18, Wimbush was the starter at the beginning of the year. He struggled. And then against, I believe, it was Vanderbilt and Ball State. They were awful offensively. Well, you throw Ian Book in the game. And Ian Book is the guy from that point forward. Last year being the best example again where Jack Cohen was definitely your guy. And Buckner, Tyler Buckner, the current starting quarterback, he got thrust in the lineup every once in a while as a change of pace situational guy. Well, against Virginia Tech, Cohen was really struggling. In goes Buckner, and he kind of lights a fire under the offense. So I think LSU fans need to be prepared that if a guy's struggling, Brian Kelly won't hesitate on putting the next guy in if he has a lot of confidence that the next guy can potentially give them a spark. So either one of these two guys, I don't know who it's going to be, I lean slightly in favor of Garrett Nussmeyer, but I also think if the offensive line struggles, the experience of Daniels and the athleticism of Daniels could be beneficial as well. So don't be surprised if both guys play early, especially if one guy's struggling. All right, another significant quarterback competition that is ongoing is to try to fill the void of the first quarterback drafted in last year's NFL draft. At Pitt, we all know that right now, replacing Kenny Pickett will be very difficult. However, there are two Capable pieces, according to Pat Narduzzi and others that have been surveying the competition from a little bit closer than we have. Nick Patty is the incumbent. He started the bowl game, was lost early. And then, of course, Keaton Slovis, the transfer from USC, who at times has been really impressive as a college football player. So here's Pat Narduzzi on where they stand right now at quarterback. It's one of your final exams. And, you know, everybody's class is a little bit different, but, you know, each one of those, your homework assignments, they do count. You got to turn that in. You can't just get an A on the test and, you know, just avoid all the homework during the semester. So uh, every day counts, you know, every pass and every, you know, 
uh, run check uh, matters. All right, Greg, we just heard from Narduzzi. Are you a little surprised that this is a continuing quarter, quarterback competition? Or, you know, would you have liked to have seen uh, Slovis named already? Oh, well, at this point, I'd love to have seen Keaton Slovis kind of pull away. But it doesn't appear like that's the case, which I find interesting, too, because when you have an incumbent situation like you do with Patty, it would be obvious that he'd have a significant head start or a leg up if the offense was the same as the year before. But we know Coach Whipple is now calling plays, the offensive coordinator from last year. He's now at Nebraska. So in comes Frank Signetti, which is a different quarterback voice. There will probably be a little carryover, but not crazy carryover as they transition from one coordinator to the next coordinator. So both guys essentially got a fresh start there at the beginning of January when they started the second semester and they started their plans for the 2022 season. So yes, in a perfect world, Slovis would have distanced himself given how aggressive Pitt was in the transfer portal to go get his services. So I'm not saying he's disappointed by any stretch. Maybe if anything, Patty has just surprised with the way he's been able to keep this competition close. I still think by the time we roll around to the backyard brawl, we know like we've talked about already on this show, week one game against West Virginia is a massive test. For Pitt, I think Pitt's the better football team, and I think their expectations are significant. But leaning in favor of the experienced veteran, I think, would be beneficial. So I'm leaning in favor of Slovis, and we'll see exactly how that all turns out now that they put Bo on their second scrimmage this past Saturday. All right, moving on to the next quarterback competition is a quarterback competition that is the longest-running quarterback competition in college football. That'd be the quarterback competition involving Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy for the University of Michigan. We know that it was kind of scattered throughout last season. Now, McNamara was the starter last year, but McCarthy got an awful lot of reps and did some really nice things behind a team that was on a route and they passed to the playoffs. So we know that McCarthy's the five-star superstar, but McNamara is the steady hand that did a lot as far as leadership is concerned last year that got them to where they needed to go. Here's Jim Harbaugh on the quarterback competition. They both just continue to to elevate their game really on a daily basis, um, in in every in every little way. So uh, yeah, I mean it's pretty pretty tight, pretty tight. I mean, no so. decision on the yet. No, no. Um, you know they're both they're both playing at uh, high starter caliber. <laughs> well, you hear Jim Harbaugh there, and and if there's one person in college football that's going to tell you nothing in a press conference setting, it's Jim Harbaugh. <laughs> so we know we know that's the case. And when you think about what these two guys can do, Michigan is at a little bit of a luxury right now. The luxury being time. And with the time, meaning we talked about LSU, well, LSU plays Florida State right out of the gate. Pretty dang good opponent. Oregon plays Georgia right out of the gate. Pretty good opponent. We talked about Pitt. They play West Virginia right out of the gate. Pretty good opponent. So the last three coaches we've talked about, they don't have the luxury of time. They better have a dude ready to rock week one because the team they're playing against could very easily beat them. Now, no disrespect to Colorado State or Hawaii or UConn, but those are the three teams that Michigan starts the season with. So why is it that right now, there's an emphasis on trying to figure out who your guy's going to be. You very clearly have time on your side. So take your time. And if the competition carries over into the first three weeks of the regular season, it might not have an adverse effect on you whatsoever. So it's not a big deal. Allow them to continue on. And based on what I think is going to happen, I think coaches like predictability at quarterback, meaning they know what to expect from their quarterback position. So I'm leaning just slightly in favor of Cade McNamara with JJ McCarthy having a similar role as he had last year, where he comes off the bench, provides a spark, makes some big plays, is a contributor with his legs. But McNamara is going to be very difficult to unseat, especially given how steady he was throughout what was an incredible 2021 campaign. Thanks for being with us. We really appreciate it. Please like, rate, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It really helps the show out. You can interact with the show via email at alwayscollegefootball at gmail.com. Hit us, a, hit us with a mailbag question. We got a bunch of them. We're going to start getting to more of those, especially as the season rolls around. And there's more questions that need to be answered as we start to find out more and more about these teams. You can also interact with us on social media, on Instagram, and on Twitter at alwayscfb. 
For all of us here at Always College Football, we really appreciate you. For Mark Kubiak, I'm Greg McElroy. We hope you have a tremendous day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.